And to do so, I'm going to use the variable resolution mesh, which we haven't quite thought about a lot today. Um, so global convective permitting scale simulations are still... Oh, sorry. No. So global convective permitting scale simulations remain quite expensive. So if we want to understand, for instance, interactions between convection parameterizations, resolved convections, cloud macrophysics, radiation, then using a variable resolution mesh in MPASS is probably kind of one of the good uh, tools to, that, we can, that we can use. Um, one of the issues with using this kind of variable resolution mesh is that we want the parameterizations of deep convections to work at all scales. So in the coarse area of the mesh, as well as the most refined mesh where it's not supposed to be doing any work. So it's also important to understand the parameterizations then of the shallow convections, which remains active within the convection scheme, while the deep convections is completely uh, removed, to see how that also impacts the cloud macrophysics and the cloud radiation interactions. So to do so, uh, we focused on one suite, which is the same suite that uh, Falco and Nick used in the previous uh, two talks. But we also want, on, in addition to those, to that suite, we kind of improve the parameterizations of convections in terms of interactions with the rest of the physics, like detrainment of condensates to macrophysics, subgrid scale convective cloud feedbacks with the radiation. So it's this one, right. So here's the mesh that I've been uh, working with. Uh, the mesh is a uh, 15 to 3 kilometer variable resolution mesh, so 15 in the course. Oops, I knew I was going to mess that up. Uh, in the course area of uh, the, the globe, and then a refined domain that has resolutions of about 3 kilometers that I centered over the uh, Central Pacific Ocean because I wanted to understand the interactions between convections, grid scale, uh, cloud macrophysics, and radiations. Um, in, in, in the tropics. So uh, the summary here shows that it's computationally less expensive to use a global convective permitting resolution mesh, but we also have, we do not have need to uh, nest or nudge, nudging at the edge of the refined domain. We also allow a two-way two -way dynamical and physical interactions between the coarse area of the mesh and the refined mesh. So um, how does the difference in the grid scale, how does that impact the treatment of most processes? So, uh, and how does that affect precipitations, cloud condensate, cloud fractions, radiations over the tropical ocean? So these slides here show now the west, the east side of the refined mesh with the coarse resolution, oops, the coarse re with the coarse resolution of the mesh here, going towards the refined resolutions of the mesh here. So the suites uses the Grail fighter schemes for the convection scheme, the grid scale uh, Thomson cloud macrophysics, and this is the total precipitation. So this is the, the total precipitations now, but across that transition zone between the coarse area of the mesh and the refined uh, area of the mesh. So over the coarse regions, the convective, the parameterized convections kind of dominate. So all the total precipitations mainly come from the Grail Fighter Scheme, the GF Scheme. As we move towards across the transition zone, then the, the deep convection uh, starts to kind of, the contributions of the deep convection starts to decrease. That of the grid scale cloud metrophysics increase. This is the precipitation now that comes from the Thompson Scheme. So that when you go from the coarse mesh to the refined area of the mesh, then you almost see, you, don't, you do not see any uh, spurious transitions in the total precipitation. And here's a list of the other parameterizations that are used in my simulation. So this uh, slide here show now the monthly mean precipitations for December 2015. So what we did is that we ran that mesh for a full month. We kind of have a two-day spin-up. We use uh, uh, daily, daily varying sea uh, surface temperature. 
And we then we compute the, the monthly mean, uh, monthly mean, December 2015 monthly mean. So on the left panel here is simply a trim tree, tree, uh, tree B42. And now on the left, the right panel here shows the precipitation difference between uh, the model simulations and trim data for the variable resolution mesh. And now the same simulation, the same setup for the simulations, but now using a uniform mesh. Again, that's just precipitation uh, difference here. So I also added the kind of like the, you know, the, the ISO line showing the, the mesh refinement for the uniform mesh so we kind of look at the same area of the, of the ocean. Uh, so what you can see is that there are pretty large biases between uh, the, against uh, trim 342 uh, in the uniform mesh and in a uniform mesh and a variable resolution mesh. So there is increased precipitation along the Eastern Pacific Ocean, right here in both simulations. There is decreased precipitations along the ITCZ. And moreover, there is, it seems that there is a shift of the, IT, of, the ITCZ, of the ITCZ, as we can see, the precipitations in both, in both simulations. So to go a little bit deeper into the an analysis, I kind of decided to look at now the cloud properties and radiations. And to do this, I used the series single scanner footprint data, which has a 24, 20 kilometers needle resolutions. It includes the TOA, the top of the atmosphere fluxes from the series instrument. And we also have specially coincident cloud properties that have been averaged within the series footprint. So we can easily compare cloud optical properties and radiations together. So to compute the monthly mean, what I did is that I regretted that single scanner footprints within a 0.2 degree uh, rectangular mesh. And I kind of use my early MPAS output to follow what the satellite would see to recalculate my, my, uh, the monthly mean. So we, we, you, we see exactly the same. We calculated monthly mean from the satellite data and from the, uh, from the model the same way. So on the, on the top, on the left-hand side here, we see two, two instances of uh, orbits from the aqua satellites uh, for the top of the atmosphere OLR and the corresponding cloud fraction. <coughs> so when you, this first, this, this next slide here now sees, shows the vertically integrated cloud liquid water pass against from uh, now the series data, the variable resolution mesh, and the uniform mesh at the, at the bottom. What we see is that there is a large amount of low-level cloud over the entire tropics, uh, increased cloud liquid water pass along the ITCZ with uh, instance of uh, deeper convection from uh, deeper, deeper convection along, also along the ITCZ and some of the, the, the SPCZ. Now, when we compare the uniform mesh against the variable resolution mesh, what strikes out very early on is that we have an increased cloud liquid water pass along the ITCZ in the uniform mesh compared to the variable resolution mesh, uh, and also compared to the series data. So there is definitely a bias in the interactions between the parameterized convections, the cloud macrophysics, that kind of induce uh, increased cloud liquid water content uh, over, over these regions. In, in variable resolution mesh, where the grid scale cloud macrophysics takes over, and when there is very little uh, convection, except for the shallow convections, then we see that the liquid water path is only decreased relative to the uniform mesh simulation. In contrast, when we look at the cloud liquid, cloud ice path, the series data show pretty high uh, cloud ice path along the ITCZ as well as along the Eastern Pacific Oceans and the warm pool region. Now, the uniform mesh kind of has an tendency to underestimate the ice path relative to the satellite data. And the variable resolution mesh, uh, where the grid scale macrophysics is dominant, actually kind of does a, be a much better job to kind of simulate what your satellite kind of has observed. Although it seems to be also uh, quite a bit overestimated in that case. So looking at those results, I was wondering, is it just a question of the grail file schemes that has kind of uh, biases and weaknesses in the parameterizations of the detrainment of the cloud liquid water and ice and it's how it interacts with the macrophysics and the radiations? Or is it the same for another convective parameterizations? <coughs> so I use the, I I use the second uh, scale-aware parameterizations, which is the multi-scale Kentridge parameterizations developed by 
Kieran Alapati at EPA. It's scale insensitive now with, in a different way through, the, ad, through uh, the scale dependence of the adjustment time scale as well as uh, different formulations of the entrainment rate that also takes into account the dependence of the uh, spatial resolution of the mesh. So there is, of course, a very large difference between GF and MSKF in terms of the entrainment rate, the formulations of the closure that determines the cloud-based mass flux, uh, as well as the formulations of condensation and formation processes in the cloud model, partitioning between detrained ice and water, and the treatment of the non-precipitating shallow convection in its interactions with the grid scale microphysics, which are still active even over the, the refined uh, area of the mesh. So I redid the same simulations now using a 30 kilometer uniform mesh to save a little bit of computer time. And so the plot here shows the same trim 3B42 TMP data that I showed earlier. This is the total precipitations from the GF scheme, that from MSKF. And now this is a difference again between the simulations and the, and the trim data. And as for the GF scheme, the MSKF cannot display the same type of biases. Increased precipitations over the Eastern Pacific Ocean, decreased precipitations where the ITCZ should be, and then kind of like a shift of the ITCZ southward to where it's actually observed. So as, in a sense, I kind of thought that was kind of nice because then I can go back and look at the cloud optical properties and kind of see if uh, how kind of the, the same biases and precipitations can be produced by two different parameterizations that have different interactions with the microphysics. So now for the, against using a 30 kilometer uniform mesh, is a, I kind of really now did a December uh, 2015 and a June 2016 monthly simulations. We also, we again have the liquid water path for uh, the uh, solid data, the GF scheme, the MSKF scheme, and you can see that now both simulations show very different uh, cloud liquid water, pa water paths over the tropics, where we have an overestimations of the liquid water path in both months from the GF scheme, but now we have an underestimations of the liquid water path relative to the observations. Particularly in MSKF, we don't have a lot of very low level clouds slash low convections that should appear in these areas here, where the cloud liquid water path is extremely low relative to the observations and even the other scheme. In terms of the ice path, now it's a little bit different. We have GF kind of have a smaller amount of ice water path compared to the satellite data, and MSKF now show higher amount of ice water path relative to the observations and the other scheme. So how does, in, how does the, the two uh, convection scheme have now uh, behave within a variable resolution mesh? So here I show uh, the same uh, locations for, I used the 30 to 6 now variable resolution mesh. It's centered at the, at the same locations as my 15 to 3 uh, resolution mesh over the Central Pacific Ocean. The, the, these slides show now the convective precipitation rate only, and what you can see is a decrease in convective precipitations as we go again for the course to the refine area of the mesh in both in both simulation. But was that so? And here is the equivalent uh, uh, simulations, but now with the 30 kilometer uniform mesh. And I thought what was kind of quite uh, interesting is that compared relative to the uniform mesh, the variable resolution mesh with the GF scheme produces an increased convective precipitations relative to the uniform mesh, but now outside of the refined area of the mesh. So it seems that there is a strong dynamical interactions between the coarse and refined area of the mesh over a monthly time scale, which I didn't kind of didn't quite see in a 15 to 3 simulations and haven't really kind of picked up on before. That the, the difference out in the, over the course area of the mesh is less in the MSKF simulation, but you do see the same decrease in the convective precipitations between the two simulations. So, in terms of the cloud liquid water path, the kind of the the 30 to 6 variable resolution mesh kind of shows the same kind of decrease, slightly decrease in the cloud liquid water path over uh, the, the refined area of the mesh. MSKF did show that earlier also that it had 
uh, less liquid oil, uh, smaller liquid oil path than, than GF. For the uh, 30 kilometer, that would be actually that would be GF here. We see that uh, there is again a, a kind of a different distributions of the liquid water pass over the course area of the mesh between the two simulation. So again, there is like a kind of some kind of in dynamical inter induced interactions between the physics and the dynamics that kind of produces very much different, very different patterns of the liquid water pass over the course area of the mesh. What I thought is interesting in a variable resolution mesh using MSKF, now we kind of have an increase in that shallower convection, low level clouds that we don't see in the 30 kilometer mesh. So in summary, <laughs> we saw that there was very significant dis biases in the distributions of precipitations, cloud liquid water path, and ice path between my different simulations not only between over the course area of the mesh for uh, both convection scheme, but also over the refined area of the mesh. So parameterizations of convection cannot be simply substituted with another without re important retuning of the parameterizations and its interactions with the other scheme. So we keep, it's probably kind of important to focus and improve one physics suite instead of kind of shuffling parameterizations like so we sometimes do. I think focus should be given to improve microphysics and precipitation processes within the convection scheme. Like for instance, kind of focus on precipitation, condensations, deposition processes, a little bit like grid scale cloud microphysics, but now inside the convective cloud model. So we have a decrease in the uh, bias between the transition zone between the refine and coarse area of the mesh. Uh, again, kind of Variable resolution experiment kind of look in more details and impact the refine area of the mesh on the course area of the mesh on monthly time scale. Thank you.